Welcome to Slash Forward. Hey, what would you do if someone tried to gather up your body to add to their personal collection? On the one hand, it would be nice to feel wanted, but on the other hand, it's nice to have personal autonomy. In consideration of this quandary, today we'll be looking at the collection, the follow-up to the collector, and taking a detailed view of the storyline and possible strategies for beating this sick freak. Along the way, be sure to drop a comment to identify any openings you feel would facilitate parting ways with your new master. Let's get to it. We open on a young lady named Elena, getting a pep talk from Shooter McGavin, who makes promises I will always be here. He is unable to keep. Then, from expositional news stories, we learn that your boy's been on a bit of a murder spree about town. There's an active manhunt to find any potential captive victims, with Arkin being the most recent. Concurrent to this timeline, we meet back up with a now-grown Elena, picking up a voice call on her Blackberry. It's her boo, Brian, canceling their plans for the evening due to an overwhelming work schedule. Which is fine, because Missy shows up, unannounced, dressed for an evening of debauchery. On her way out, we see that Mr. Peters is still here. Hey, good for him. And soon, Elle's hopping into the car, and we get strong indications that it causes Josh to tent his trousers. They find an unusual man in an alley, and upon stating the password, a world of dubstep and house music opens itself to them. The trio finds themselves immediately at home amongst their fellow club rats, as they lose themselves in a sea of gyrating flesh. Their bliss is interrupted, however, when Elle runs across bitch boy Brian, unrepentantly making out with some rando. She ends their relationship and storms off as a familiar figure watches from the catwalk. Elena eventually finds an empty room, in which she may cry out her troubles. Except it's not empty, it contains a large red box. Upon opening it, Arkin bursts out and drags her down to avoid a spear, which we follow backwards through a CGI joyride that eventually winds up a steam-powered combine harvester that threatens to harvest the clubsters. And then does just that. Back at the start, Arkin's aggressive requests for help fail to endear him to Elena. She then runs out in the confusion and finds her fellow dance mates getting machete hacked in the gunt. Arkin uses a repurposed earring to employ his lockpicking magic while Elle runs away and turns a corner just in time to find Missy caught up in a cattle call, wherein she's about to get slowly pressed by the collector, which is kinda mean. After the gang's precious nutrients are extruded, Elle makes it back to find Arkin busy escaping despite his prior relationship with Windows. He graces her with some feeble advice Look out! before doing so himself, but instead she gets boxed up as the collector gazes wistfully at his lost prize, and then they concurrently run and drive off. We find Arkin in the ER being examined and patched up, although the work is briefly interrupted by the police who want to ensure he doesn't go running off somewhere. <laughs> they must not have told them about his injuries. When he wakes up, Lisa's there, and she's decided to stay. Murder has brought them back together, but they're also accompanied by an anonymous gift with a message threatening their safety, so Arkin sends her off. That evening, he receives a visit from Lucello, a man under the employ of Mr. Peters. He's seeking information about the collector and has assembled a team with the intent to track and kill the killer while retrieving Elena. Concerned for the general safety of his own family, Arkin is more than willing to help lead them there. After calling to share the good news, we flash back to learn that Lucello has also always been there. Then Elena wakes up in her box, which is likely fairly ripe at this point, but it does have a ventilation hole that's good for peeping. Through this, she sees a man receiving an unspecified and unsolicited surgical intervention, with end results that are kinda bitchin'. Meanwhile, back at the briefing room, the rules are set. Arkin will help them locate, but will not go into the building. Starting from the abduction point, they will follow the pacing and directions indicated by his lacerations until they reach the end of the road. This terminates at a spooky abandoned hotel, which is promising, and Arkin is convinced to show them the way in. As they approach the door and Arkin plies his trade, Elle uses her brassiere to fishhook the latch on her box. Luckily, it was the only one that was closed, as upon yanking hard, the box then immediately opens. She finds herself in a laboratory of sorts and is prevented from leaving by the master's return. When he sees the box open, he knows what's up and plays a little spidery game to flush out his prey. We learn that spiders sure do love crawling on people's faces. At the breaking point, Elle is saved when Arkin cracks the front door, setting off an alarm. As we catch up with the team, we then discover that Arkin is now getting the hard sell to help them navigate the interior. Do they know that he had been inside a box? Elle still finds herself locked in the room, however, by using a scalpel, she's able to pop open a grate, and despite the uncomfortable quantity of blood, 
blood, she ventures in. Elsewhere, the gang finds themselves in the bug zapper needle room, so they've barely made progress. Lynn gets himself chopped up at the front door, and while distracted, they're ambushed by a strung out tweaker. The collector keeps them around to do his bidding, but before they can make a plan for dealing with this, they're descended upon by the rest of the group and just barely manage to shoot their way to a safe little alcove where they can lock down and assess the situation, which is bad. Elle emerges into a princess makeup room occupied by a box lady who she lets out. Abby seems normal-ish, but they have to work through some trust issues. Elaine is pretty keen on continuing toward the exit, so despite Abby's apprehensions, she's able to goad her out the door. Meanwhile, the team comes into a clearing where another victim staggers out with a neck-bound payload that goes off, followed by several murderous lactites that run Dre through in a vertical orientation. This gives Arkin the chance to skedaddle down a nail-adorned crevice and into an office with poor lighting, where he manages to just narrowly avoid recollection. At the same time, Abby is showing Elle the ropes, distinguishing undesirable rooms guarded by tripwire and being generally supportive and engaging, until Elle's earpiece puts off some nasty feedback, drawing attention to her imperfection. Abs becomes convinced this disadvantage will guarantee their failure. <laughs> ableist much? And her cries summon the collector, who pursues Elle down the dark hallways. He eventually loses her amidst the ceiling plumbing before becoming distracted by the sound of Arkin cranking on some knobs nearby. He demonstrates he's learned nothing as he how-do's a knife blade and then narrowly avoids another trap. Despite these travails, he eventually finds himself in a much more calm and professional environment. As Elle continues on, she eventually comes to a hallway, in which she jiggles her earpiece right onto one of a series of bear traps. She manages to retrieve it, and despite the hair trigger on this sucker, she proceeds. When we catch back up with Arkham, he is now proceeded further into what appears to be a sort of viewing room that reveals the collector not only acquires, but also creates works of great beauty and sophistication. Here he runs across a young lady pinned to a wall, but before he can take any action, the collector returns, looking to cross her off his to-do list for the day before getting back to the hunt. Arkin then snags himself a pin so he can have unlimited access to locked doors. Elsewhere, Elle finds a funhouse-style fan hole through which she attempts to call out to a couple of gentlemen keeping warm, but to no avail. As Arkin proceeds carefully, he's eventually reunited with his old buddies, who he had obviously been looking for. They try to snatch him up again, but there's only one true abductor in this house, and he's going fishing. He's also stepped up his kung fu training since they last met, as with a simple flick of the wrist, he manages to send Paz screaming down a hallway past a door that locks behind her. Arkin tries to take this opportunity to convince Lucello that it's time to find a pathway out, but he refuses to leave Elle behind, and then Abby stumbles in, providing hope that they have a means by which they can locate Elle. Unfortunately, along the way, they're distracted by Paz's screams and are compelled to move toward the sound. Lucello proceeds slowly down a haunted hallway, and at the end, discovers he was tricked. Elena had similarly been pursuing the screams and was actually the one on the right track. Arkin then follows Abby's gaze only too late to the cord wire to a series of detonators that go off in reverse order, allowing Lucello to run down the hall just ahead of a sequence of glitter bombs going off around him, like an absolute badass. They're then able to dip into an adjacent room to meet up with Elle just as she's removing Paz's razor net. Here, they all take a minute to just vibe out until Abby's presence ruins it. Elena then leads them to a possible way out, and Arkin goes for the Hail Mary. He puts a slug into the man, attracting quick attention, which he then reinvigorates in their general direction with the final bullet. Desiring to maintain the cozy home base he spent so long working on, the collector straps up and readies himself. With the end in sight, Abby now demonstrates her true Stockholmian allegiance. Paz cold cocks her, resulting in an outcome that far exceeds expectations. Then the collector busts in and starts spraying indiscriminately until he's empty. In the aftermath, angered by the fate of his most precious, he claims a consolation prize and darts off. Lucello finds himself on the brink of being snapped up, and right when time is of the essence, so he sends them off and fends for himself. As the SWAT team rolls in, the survivors try to prevent one last art installment, but soon find themselves ensnared and staring into the eyes of a stone-cold killer. Arkin reverts back to his old tricks and tries to rile him up so he makes a mistake, but the collector is in total control here, and he casually prepares to eliminate the evidence of his misdeeds, laying down some flammable liquids and stoking up a fire. From inside the cage, they try to reach the latch, but can't quite get to it, so Arkin sets himself up and kindly requests L provide him a second elbow. He then uses this like a drill bit extender, achieving an unnatural angle that allows him to flip the latch. Paz quickly resets his arm, a huge help, and then they run. They arrive at the specimen room, where the collector unceremoniously stabs Paz, and then Arkin gets his shit rocked. 
At just that moment, Lucello shows up and some classic knife play ensues. They do what they must, but you can really tell they've formed a mutual respect. Even so, Lucello gets it. Arkin sees an opening and tops him, but he fails to control the knife hand and takes a blade through both cheeks. El sees that they're very close to a way out and alerts emergency personnel to their presence, while Arkin goes beast mode, taking in some intense sustained eye contact before dumping his foe into the bin and sending him a little flame that results in the collector's death and the deaths of all the innocent victims down there with him. As the firemen work to disassemble the doorway, Arkin's escape is blocked. At the end of his rope, he goes ahead and gives in as the flames comfortingly lick at him like little incendiary tongues. But then Elle steps up to achieve her redemption and starts busting open the large jars surrounding them that are, thankfully, not full of formaldehyde. Once they make it outside, they get all patched up and reunited, and Arkin goes to do his own accounting of the bodies. He finds a box with a smoking mask, but no evidence of its owner. We then flash forward some time later to a well-kept home. A man arrives and turns on the news, but a sudden station change alerts him to a presence. He proceeds cautiously until Arkin reveals himself. He's been stalking the 14 licensed entomologists who live within a 200-mile radius when he happened to come upon him. A museum owner's son driven insane at a young age by the bug madness. Vowing to make sure he feels what his victims felt, Arkin then entraps him forcefully in a box. This was a solid follow-up. Unfortunately, despite going into pre-production, the third installment has been officially killed, meaning we won't get to see Arkin take his revenge. Although that also means that the lessons learned here should should be sufficient to ensure your full survival in the event of a collector-like abduction. So let's work through the scenarios presented to see how we could maximize survivability. Starting with the club scene, there are a few general rules and expectations here that will be of service to us throughout life. It's not clear how this setup came to be. Did the collector retrofit this rave site in preparation for the week's festivities? Or is it a purpose-built location that he set up and then promoted so as to draw in his victim pool? Did he hire this guy to work the door, for instance? Both possibilities are hard to fathom, but either way, this is not a scenario you go into with the expectation of danger, which is why it's so important to abide by a praxis of generally applicable rules. To start, you have to train your mind and body to get high on life. Just feel the music and become energized by the pull pulsating, sweaty mass of humanity around you. Because if you come here looking to get trashed on some low-grade club drugs, you're pretty much done before you start. It's hard to pick out specific details in these kinds of settings, so any inhibition to this will essentially ensure you come out of the scenario dead. Using this as a foundation, there are two simple rules to employ. The first is to always be taking in your surroundings. As you walk through unfamiliar territory, you should never be looking in a single direction for more than a few seconds before glancing around in several other directions to ensure you know what's going on around you. As you're talking to a lady, glance over each of her shoulders so you're aware of what's downfield. Whilst engaged in grinding on a man's crotch, make sure you look up and around to keep tabs on any exit points. The other rule is integral to avoid unwelcome surprises, and it's that you should always expect a ceiling thresher. This is the only way to fully protect yourself from ceiling threshers. When it inevitably happens, you'll have to make sure you consider what's best for you while assessing the crowd's inclinations. For instance, this crowd had a tendency to run to the back of the room, when it's clear that laying low was optimal for success. Not saying you can't bring a couple of your neighbors down with you, I'm just saying to not be afraid to go your own way. From there, if you're in a relatively safe spot, what do we do? Avoid unnecessary action. If there appears to be a way out, but it's been established that the main hazard are surprise traps, treat your advance like a cliff diving excursion. Always let somebody else go first to test the waters. Once in the hall, take another moment to assess your surroundings and don't be greedy about running. The traps have been sprung, and you're momentarily safe. Excessive action has been punished, so don't feel compelled to keep moving. The window did represent an excellent point of escape, although Arkin went about it in the wrong way. Sure, you will want to break the glass before going through, in order to avoid any life-threatening lacerations. However, if you find yourself using a cadaver to do so, I'm not sure you're best served by riding that poor bastard all the way to the bottom. Sure, people are basically water-filled meat sacks, but they're not the equivalent of a waterbed. They're more like like a waterbed that contains a random assortment of antlers. If you land wrong, you risk significant injury. Do the window, then tuck and roll if possible. The next scenario is the lab when Elena escapes her box. 
There was limited time to explore here before her captor returned, but there were a lot of tools available that could do quick damage, as demonstrated by her acquiring the scalpel after he left her again. Now, the collector is a formidable foe, and it's unlikely that she would have been able to handle him one on one. However, she had the element of surprise working in her favor. The key is to accept the fact that this scenario clearly indicates your captor intends to kill you rather than hold you for ransom, and so you'll have to respond with intent to kill. She ended up not having to do this but only by sheer luck. This represents a failure of character on her part, I'm sorry to say. The next sequence of calamities that befall the extraction team really just comes down to following common rules, as stated in previous videos and accentuated in this one as well. They have a tendency to tunnel hard, taking ceiling spikes through the torso. You have to take note of your surroundings. From there, Arkin puts himself into a scenario where if something were to happen, he would have no escape. He lucks through this and transitions to absent-mindedly taking unnecessary damage by shaking hands with a knife blade before nearly ending his journey after tripping a trap. He, of anyone, should know that use of the hands is of vital importance. You can't just give that up so easily, which is too bad because these little individual traps are basically throwaways. They are very easy to see and likely are intended to repel people from areas the collector intends them not to go, which seems to imply that is exactly where they want to be. For instance, the narrow hallway with the bear traps. Surely that's not just the normal state of affairs that the collector navigates through on a regular basis, especially considering their sensitivity. It is unusual that the earpiece falling on one doesn't instigate the trap, but removing it does. Regardless, this represents a choice about whether to risk injury or alert. She could basically spit on them to make them go off, allowing her to proceed more safely. However, in so doing, she may alert her enemies to her presence. This is a 50-50 scenario, and there's not really a wrong way to go about it as long as you manage to get wherever it is you're being kept from. Next, we circle back with Arkin, who is capable of using any random straight object he can find to pick any lock that exists. This speaks to the importance of being a student of life, with a thirst for knowledge who always seeks to expand on your skill set, which incidentally is a perfect segue toward bringing up today's sponsor, Skillshare. Mm, but not really. The next point where we find some clear opportunities is when Lucello goes to investigate the screams. Abby has been acting unusual for a while and warranted a closer eye. Now Arkin follows her gaze to the cord, which causes him to let out a warning yelp, but he doesn't do more than that. This is a scenario that favors definitive action. He should have let out a warning immediately, but also could have made some attempt to pull or disconnect the wire in the hope that it would have some material benefit for Lucello. After this, there's clearly no reason to trust Abby any further. Her fear that the collector is going to win and then punish her severely has tainted her entire thought process. In the case of the bombs, she proactively looked in their direction with some familiarity. It's clear that she is not fully on their side. However, I'm not sure doing anything up front would have made a huge difference. She locked them into a room, but it was the room Elena led them to. While there, she did them the service of taking out an errant trap. If they had left, they would have ran straight into the collector, who was coming down the hall with a gun and some dogs anyway. So closer supervision due to her body language and generally high level of agitation would be recommended, but had no real impact on the outcome in this particular circumstance. Things get a little muddy from here. I thought the nails were just to hurt you a little and punish a misstep, but Lucello was afraid to move, acting like the nails are meant to trip the trap hanging above him. It's also not clear how he was able to avoid a fatal outcome by apparently holding up a dog carcass? I don't know what's going on here. From there, we return full circle. I know it's hard when the finish line is in sight, but in matters of life or death, you must always be operating at 100%. If the gang had seen Elena cried out in joy, but then also assumed a ceiling thresher, they would have seen the gigantic cage dangling above them, and then been able to avoid this trap completely. It really only represents a minor annoyance, both from outside and from inside. If you watch how easily the latch slides, you'll quickly realize they likely could have shaken it loose from the inside. Or if you had someone on the outside, just easily pull it open. At this point, both you and the collector have reached the end of the road, and there's nothing more that can be done to pull you through other than to rely on your grit and force of will. But it's been a journey, so have some fun with it. As a man who clearly appreciates creativity, I'm sure if you utilized the resources around you to come up with a novel means of administering pain and punishment, he would become distracted or even possibly giddy about the opportunity to take part in your new venture. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I 
I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks uncensored movie reviews of Life Force and Under the Skin, with others to be added over time. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.